Well, hi everybody, John Walls here on theCUBE and thank you for joining us here for this CUBE conversation today. And we're talking about data. Of course, it, it's a blessing in the respect that it's become such a valuable asset. So many companies around the world. It's also a curse obviously because it is certainly can be vulnerable. Uh, it is under attack and Druva is all about protecting your data and preventing those attacks. And with us to talk about that a little bit more in depth is Jaspreet Singh, who is the founder and CEO at Druva and Stephen Manley, who is the company's CTO. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us here on theCUBE. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yep. So Jaspreet, let me just begin with you. Let, let's talk about the, the larger picture of data these days. And, and we read, it seems as though every day about some kind of invasion, you know, some ransomware attack, it's become all too commonplace. So if you would maybe just set the stage a little bit for the state of ransomware here in 2021. That's right, John. I think ransomware is now a new national uh, you know, security threat. And as you've seen all around us, this uh, almost every single day we hear about businesses getting hit with a, a new ransomware attack. Uh, ransomware 1.0 was more a malware situation impacting our data. And as you know, the pandemic transformed the, the entire data landscape, right? uh, uh, the application which are the entire supply chain delivery model has to be more online, more connected, which you know, poses more risk towards this whole approach towards uh, malware coming in. But also we're seeing ransomware 2.0, which is all about like uh, insider threats or, or, or in general security misconfiguration, which could lead to data being exfiltrated or traded off uh, in the market. So in general, uh, as data is a far more connected, far more expected to be online, security threats from either malware or human uh, oriented security issues are becoming more and more dominant threat to, to our, uh, our entire data landscape, right? Yeah, so, so Stephen, if you would, I'd like you just to follow up on this, this uh, uh, with the landscape to, to take one of Jaspreet's terms here about what you're seeing in terms of, of kind of these evolving threats now. Uh, used to be probably, I don't know, five, six years ago, it was a very different uh, set of problems and challenges and companies maybe weren't as laser focused <laughs> as they are now. Um, maybe take us through that, that process. What has happened with regard to the client base that you see and you're working with in terms of their recognition and now the steps that they need to take going forward as they modernize their operations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think there's, there's two things we see from, a, from sort of a technical perspective. The, the first one is, and, and Jesper called it ransomware 1.0. Ransomware 1.0, uh, is mainstream at this point. You know, so so you, you can go out there, you don't have to be an expert hacker. There's ransomware as a service. You know, your average, your average teenager can basically download a ransomware attack kit, uh, you know, get, a, get a, a pretty lightweight cloud account and attack school districts, hospitals, you know, municipal organizations, whatever it is, you know, with what we would consider the traditional ransomware. And, and, and that's become ubiquitous. And that's why we see all these reports of there are multiple ransomware attacks every minute you know, in the United States and around the world. So, so that's, that's, that's one part, which is you're going to get hit. Now, you'll, you'll probably get hit again with the more traditional ransomware. But you know, like any industry, the ransomware people have evolved. And so as, as Jess Breed said, they are constantly innovating. And so what we're seeing now from, a, from sort of a marketplace standpoint is you know, getting smarter about the ransomware attack. So, so laying low longer, uh, you know, sort of corrupting or attacking data a little bit more slowly so it's harder to detect. Specifically attacking backup infrastructure so that you won't be able to recover. Exfiltrating data so that, you know, so, so that now you can have sort of two types of threats. One, that your data is encrypted, and the other is, if you don't pay us, we're just going to post it on the internet. So, so you've got stage one, which is ubiquitous, and you've got to protect yourself against that because anyone can be attacked at any time. And then you've got stage two, where it's getting smarter, and that's where you know, organizations then have to step up their game and say, I've got to keep my backup safer. I've got to be able to detect things a little bit more easily. And I need to start really understanding my data footprint so I understand what could be exfiltrated and what that's going to mean to me as a business. So Jasper, uh, to that uh, point that uh, Stephen was just talking about how organizations need to get smarter. In terms of your communications that you're having with the uh, folks in the C-suite, um, is that point, is that you if they readily identified today, I mean, are, is, do they get it? Um, 
Are the, is the communication going out to their stakeholders? Are the business priorities being aligned appropriately? I mean, what, what are organizations and specifically on that executive level, what are they doing right now um, in terms of, of preparation, in terms of protections that, that uh, again, uh, are so necessary, I would think? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we, we do see customers uh, truly making uh, strides at solving the problem. There's not a one facet, you know, one solution fits all problem either, right? So there's 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 a, there's a whole protective nature of preventing a ransomware a detection and response. There's a readiness aspect of it. What happens when it do get hit? And there's a recovery element to it. How do I recover in time, in shape, you know, from a, a threat like this? So customers are evolving their understanding. At the same time, they're actually deploying appropriate technologies to to put all the three aspects of solving the solution holistically. Like any other security challenge, this is a you know this is not a one application solve all problem. Typically, there's are overlapping controls built by multiple group and multiple parties to make sure you're ready and to response uh, towards a threat like this. And, and just to jump in, because one of the things I find fascinating as we go through this, the customer conversations I have, I've I've been doing you know sort of data protection for a lot a long time. We won't get into that, but. <laughs> But most of my time I, I'd spent talking to, you know, VPs of IT, maybe I'd see a CIO. It's fascinating now, we will have conversations with boards of directors because it's become such a big issue. And the focus is, is, is so different, right? Because they understand that this isn't just like a usual backup and recovery or even a traditional disaster recovery that you might do from a natural disaster or some sort of hardware outage. They're seeing that there are so many stages now to an orchestrated recovery, these customers we work with, where it, it's, it's, it's not just about, I need a little bit of technology. They're really looking for, how do I operationalize all this? You know, because once you're up at the board of directors, this is no longer a which product is better than X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. It's a discussion about who can really insulate me from the risk because these, these can be you know, business ending events if you're not careful. All right, I mean, you're right, it's a great point. And actually, Stephen, I hadn't really thought about these fiduciary responsibilities that boards have. And, and obviously we think about operations, we think about p &L, right? We think about all, but I hadn't really thought about how also data protection, and I want to talk about data resiliency, how those come into play as well uh, as those board decisions are made. So let's talk about resiliency. I want you guys to explain this concept to me. Um, so the, you know, what, what's the distinction between protection and resiliency? Because to me, they're, they're maybe not exactly synonymous, but they're kind of cousins in some respects. So uh, Jasper, if you will talk about resiliency and, and how you define that. Sure, so as uh, Stephen mentioned, right? The, the prediction was more about how do I actually safeguard my data to actually you know, recover from an incident, right? Readiness is, uh, or residency is all about uh, being ready to, to tr truly respond in time, right? The, the forward leaning posture of making sure, you know, am, am I ready to not just recover from uh, a very, uh, you know, age old problem of application failure or, or human errors, but also a cyber attack or a, you know, a true age incident or a cyber recovery or security incident, which I'm prepared to respond in a appropriate SLA across the board, right? Uh, and resiliency also goes beyond, you know, just the, the nature of data itself, right? You're, you're talking about applications, environments, ecosystem to truly understand the, the enterprise operational needs, IT needs, data needs to be holistically thought through. How, how do I get my business online faster, right? And that's the true nature of differentiation between uh, protection going towards resiliency. And, and it's obviously driving a lot of your product development, right? And, and, and I know you've got the data resilience, resiliency cloud um, service that you're offering now. So Steve, and let, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, what was the genesis of that offering and, and what do you see as its primary advantages to your clients? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think there's there's really those those two key words there. It's resiliency and it's cloud. So, just Bree kind of walked about how you know, resiliency is that step forward. It's that shift left, whatever term you want to use. To me, the best part about the cloud is, and like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've yet to meet a customer who's come to me and said, "I really wish I could spend more money and more time on my data protection infrastructure. I love sticking together multiple separate products. It's just a great use of my time." Right? Nobody says that. You know, what they really say is, could you just solve this problem for me? 
This is this is hard. Uh, capacity planning and patching and upgrades and tying together all the different components from up to seven different vendors. This is hard work. And I just need this to work. I need this to work seamlessly. And so we, we, we looked at that cloud part and we said, well, when you think of cloud, you think of something that's flexible. You think of something that's on demand. You think of something that does the job for you. And so you know, when we talk about this data resiliency cloud, it's about you know, moving onto your front foot, getting aggressive, being ready for, for what's coming, but having, you know, frankly, Druva do it for you, as opposed to saying, here's some technology, good luck, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Customer. You know, we've got this solved for you. It's our job to take care of it. And to add to it, you know, this entire resiliency equation cannot be solved through a simple a software-based approach is a fundamental belief because the same network, the same principles of operation, the same people involved, you know, were, were those who were involved around the primary application, you know, the, the resiliency aspect has to be air gap appropriately, not just at the data level, but IT and operations level as well, right? So a notion of a cloud, almost a social distancing for your data, right? And your and, and your key jewels of the enterprise that, hey, if, if anything happens to my primary network application stack data, my secondary cloud, my resiliency cloud, is ready to respond in appropriate defined SLAs to recover my business holistically as a combination of uh, integrating with SecOps, as a combination of truly integrating disaster recovery elements with cyber recovery elements, truly understanding application recovery from a backup and recovery point of view. So holistically understanding the nation of resiliency and simplifying it through the elements of public cloud. And so how do you bend that for your clients? Because as, as you both have pointed out, they have different needs, right? And they have, they have different, uh, obviously different, they're involved in different sectors with different operations, with different priorities and all that. How is the, the data resiliency cloud uh, providing them with the kind of flexibility you need, the kind of adaptability that you need in order to conform it for what you need and not necessarily you know, what someone else in another sector is, is all about? So, so, so for me, there, there's a couple things that that is great about about being the, the data resiliency cloud. One is you know, we've got well over 3,500 customers, which means that no matter what segment you're looking in, you're not going to be alone, right? If you're if you're healthcare, if you're finance, if you're manufacturing, Druva Druva understands you know what you and many of of your similar sort of uh, you know, companies look like which enables us to, to, to work in a lot of ways. It enables us to understand what trends are happening across your industry, whether it's you know, ransomware attacks that are coming across, you know, say manufacturing space and, and how those look or what data growth looks like or what type of applications are important in those industries. So it's, it's really useful for us to be able to say, we, we understand these different verticals because we've got such a broad customer base. I, I think the second thing that comes in then is Every customer I meet, the number one question they ask me, and it might, it might not be the first one, but it's the one they want to ask. It's always, how am I doing compared to everybody else? Mm -hmm. And so it's really useful to, to be able to sit down and say, look, in your industry, this is what we see as the standards right now. So this is where you fall. You're sort of maybe a stage two, everybody else is at stage three, we'll help you move forward. Mm -hmm. Your industry as a whole is actually ahead of many of the other industries, but this is what's coming next for, for others. And so it's really useful for those customers to understand where they sit in respect to, to sort of the broader marketplace. And, and so that's one of the values I think we bring is that we do have such a broad understanding of our customers because we are a service as opposed to just selling software. You know, and those customers too, um, as you talked about, they're looking maybe at their, their competitive landscape and trying to decide, okay, are, are we keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak? Um, but all of you, all of us, we're all trying to, we're trying to keep up with the bad guys. And, and so in terms of that going forward, what is that challenge for you at Druva in terms of being anticipatory, in terms of, of trying to recognize uh, their trends and their movements and and their forward thinking, so that you can be that that great uh, protective mechanism. You could be that prophylactic measure that stands between a company and something you know bad from happening. 
So, so I, I'll, I'll start, and then uh, it, it's funny because uh, you know, Jess Breit and I just this morning we were actually talking about some of the future of ransomware protection, and and one of the things that we we are using a lot in Driven, and, and I, I get every company says they're doing it, is the use of AI ML, especially in detecting uh, sort of unusual trends. Um, but but you know, but I think we're different than most because the AI ML we use is again across you know two and a half billion backups every year, right? Because we, we, get, we get visibility across everybody. So it's not just isolated, but we're looking at things like, you know, unusual access patterns and the data, unusual access patterns based on administrators. Because like Jaspreet said, said at the beginning, one of the things we see the ransomware attackers doing is they're trying to get entire control of your environment because if I control your environment, if I control your phone system, your email, I can get control of your backup application and delete everything. So we're even doing things to sort of prevent, oh, you know, we're getting unusual administrative access patterns. Let's stop that. We're getting unusual recovery patterns. Maybe that's somebody trying to, to steal data out. Let's track that. So our use of AI ML is, is across a much broader data set than anybody else. And it's looking at a lot more than just, you know, sort of data, data pattern changes to, to a much broader set of things. And, and, and basically, again, it's, it's sort of a, a biweekly meeting we have where Jesper comes in with more ideas basically for our, for, uh, for our team to sort of go, what else can we do? Because the landscape keeps changing. And on top of it, I think also, if you think about data protection or even data storage was never designed from a security point of view. It was always designed from a point of view of recoverability of data through an application issues or some, some basic data corruption, right? But security oriented thinking helped us also fundamentally understand how do we think about, you know, elements of zero trust all around the platform, right? How, how do you make sure to what Steven mentioned, if your IDP gets compromised, if you do have a bad actor enter a, a data you know, protection solution like us, how do you still make sure levels of authorization, immutability, like multiple levels of mm -hmm. control that are in place to make sure no bad actor take control uh, and true recoverability resiliency is, is possible across a variety of scenarios and, and, and truly customer driven SLA. So both foundationally, uh, we've, we've truly built something which is now uh, it's, you know very deep in and focus on security. The same time, as Stephen mentioned, through understanding of customer landscape, really helps us uh, understand bad actors far more better and more you know, faster than many of our uh, in the industry competition. Well, the need is great, that's for sure. And, and gentlemen, I want to thank you for the time today to talk about uh, what Druva is doing and wish you continued success down the road. Thanks to you both. Thank you. All right, we've been talking about data, keeping it safe, keeping your data safe. That's what Druva is all about. And I'm John Walls and you've been watching theCUBE.